great to see you guys. Uh, whoa, I thought uh, Mike James did an awesome job in our community. Like, man, he upstaged the preacher. It's not fair. Um, we are um, continuing on a series uh, that we had started at the beginning of the month. Uh, called Masquerade, and I believe uh, our singles minister, Illumine, started that out. And he shared a scripture uh, in, in the Bible that says that Satan masquerades as an angel of the light. And he talked about how, you know, sometimes uh, things that we can think are good end up being bad. And uh, then uh, last week, Kevin Quist, who's uh, one of the leaders, uh, his own leaders in our church, he did a great message about the masks that we wear. There's kind of a gap between who we think we are and uh, who we see in the mirror, and just kind of closing that gap. And then um, uh, also he talked about there's a, there's a gap between, uh, you know, what people see and uh, who we actually are. So I want to continue up on that theme, but before I go, I just wanted to uh, make sure that uh, we are all fasting and praying uh, for the Detroit Lions. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, I want to start off with this uh, passage here in uh, Jeremiah 17. It says, The heart's deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and examine the mind. And so the idea in this series is that we're going to examine this truth. That things aren't as they seem. And this extends, when you look at this passage, it's saying the heart's deceitful, that even the things in our heart, even the things that are going on here, even what we think is going on in our hearts, also deceive us. What do I mean? Well, for example, I know this with men. This is a big one. It can also apply to women. But for example, hurt. Our hurt masquerades often as anger. That we think we're just incredibly angry. But what's going on is we're wounded spiritually. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We're damaged. We're struggling with something and we can't get open. We can't get real. And so all you see is the mask of anger. But I love this part in the thought says, I, Lord, I, the Lord, search the heart. In other words, God sees what's really going on. Uh, what's another example? Uh, idolatry. You know what that idolatry? It, it doesn't mean you're bowing down to an idol necessarily. It really, it literally means anything you put before God, right? So anything like it could be a relationship, it could be money. Idolatry masquerades often as busyness. Oh my gosh, I'm just so busy for this, for church, for God. But really, it's idolatry. But it's masquerading as, oh, I'm just so busy, right? Uh, selfishness, right? Selfishness masquerades sometimes as, as, as introversion. You know, we, we hear about, oh, I'm a, my, my two best friends, two of my best friends are introverts. And they're incredibly loving and giving people. Okay. We, there's a different way, I guess, we all get energy. But being an introvert is no excuse for being selfish, right? That's right. Hey, it's time to give to somebody. We got people coming over, whatever. Hey, I'm saying hi to you. Oh, I'm an introvert, I'm not gonna say hi back. But that's a masquerade for when we choose to be selfish sometimes. Oh, yeah. And what I'm just trying to say is the heart's deceitful about things. Okay, and there's a lot of things that we think one thing is going on, but it's just a masquerade for another. There's so many, right? Sometimes cowardice, our fear masquerades as intellectualism, right? That's right. Right? And insecurity masquerades as overconfidence. And we battle this all the time. Because the heart is deceitful above all things. I love this passage here. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, Don't consider his appearance or his height. I reject them. The Lord doesn't look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance. Ain't that the truth? But the Lord looks at the heart. In other words, God's not fooled by the mask that you wear. Right. He sees you exactly the way you are. Yeah, way he sees that. you unmasked. You could be smiling today, but he sees the sorrow in your heart. You could be sorrow. You, you, he sees us unmasked. Because I, people, well, we can only see the outward appearance. But God, well, he sees right into our hearts. So this thing about masks. 
So masks, there's a phenomena about masks that we know and that we start to feel uninhibited when we have a mask on, right? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. This the psychologist will tell you that, that there's, been, there's been case studies where kids are super shy, they put on a mask and all of a sudden they can dance and then they slowly strip away that mask to kind of release their inhibitions. Uh, you know, people hide under a fake email and, hey, let me tell you what I really think of Clifton Brent. I'm going to beat you up. And, you know, and then you're like, yeah, you just feel you could say that because it's under a hidden email. And then you see, hey, Cliff, <laughs> you're awesome. And uh, we, we do that, right? The, the inhibitions just go away when you think people can't see you. That's right. And so that's why I wear them. But, but there's this... There's this reality about a mask, right? So what, what psychology tells us is that when I put this on, oh, stop. Oh, oh wow. I, I start to feel uninhibited, you know? You know, it's kind of like uh, some of us when we're home alone, you know, you start to sing, you start to dance in a way that you never would publicly. Oh, wow. But here's this reality, right? When you put this on, here's the reality. I'm gonna find this, I'm doing this blind that what hides you also blinds you. Wow. Right? Wow. You hide behind the busyness, you're blinded. You, you hide behind anger, that anger is blinding you to the effect that you're having on other people. You're hiding behind a certain image, but that image is blinding you from what's going on all around you. The idolatry, you're hiding behind it, right? But that idolatry is blinding you to what God is doing in your life. You're, you're blinded by all these things that you think you're hiding under. You're hiding under a veneer of, ah, I just, I'm good. But you're also blinded to all the people that are reaching out to you, right? What hides you behind? I wanna look at uh, an interaction between Jesus and a guy who I look at as just a very authentic person. And I think the interaction that Jesus has with him, it's a model for us. It's a model for what unmasked, authentic interaction with God will look like. That's right. So let's read together here. It's in Mark chapter 10. It says, when they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind, a blind man, Bartimaeus, and the, those of you who know that word bar means son of, right? So if I was the son of Frank, I'd be, hey, I'm Mark Bar Frank. So this was Bar Timaeus, which means son of Timaeus, right? Mm -hmm. Was sitting by the roadside begging, and when he heard it was Jesus of Nazareth, well, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. So, of course, the irony here is this man's physically blind, but if you've met a blind person, you know that there's something refreshingly authentic about that, right? Right. I, uh, in uh, Milwaukee, we, we had this event called the Respite Event, and we were given, uh, every one of the disciples that had signed up had to spend, a, you know, what, six, seven hours w with a special needs child. And so I got assigned a child named Chris, who had cerebral palsy and was blind. And that's daunting, and I'll tell you why that's daunting, because when you're spending time with a child, and particularly a child that's blind, is they don't care uh, how tall you are, how much money you make, they don't care about your title, they don't care that you got a PhD, they don't care that you got your 401k, all they care about is are you capable of loving them. Right. Right. And so there's something authentic, they don't care if you're good looking, if you, if you wore something nice today, if you wore your Sunday best, they don't care about anything. So all, the only thing that mattered to Chris and I, and this is why it's intimidating, like, all that matters is can I make this kid feel loved? There's, there's nothing, it doesn't matter if I'm on stage, None of that matters, right? And so here's a blind guy. And what does he do when he hears that Jesus is there? He begins to shout. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know when's the last time you shout. I started thinking, when do I shout? I'm like, I don't shout often. And I thought to myself, uh, a couple times, uh, I, I could, but came to my mind, I don't shout often. One, uh, when we lived in Milwaukee, we had terrible plumbing uh, because of, like, we had so many trees. And I just remember that feeling when, you know, the toilet overflows. You're just like... Ruth, get the plunger. Like, that, that's an all-out emergency, right? That's, that's an all, like, let's shout. I remember one time uh, herniating a disc in my back, you know, about 15 years ago, and not being able to move, and just, like, literally crawling in the basement. At the time, just screaming, Ruth, I need help. And, and she's like, what, what, what? And she just couldn't believe I was in that much pain, right? And so here's 
a very authentic person. He's not ironically blinded like you and I by the things that we see. He probably doesn't care what he looks like in this moment because he's blind. He doesn't even know what he looks like. He right. doesn't care about what's appropriate. And when he sees and hears about Jesus, he shouts. And I think when you understand that Jesus is here, what, what are you compelled to do? You're compelled to want to shout out. So I want to ask a question, and this is just a question that we can, you know, marinate on and just to think about. But I believe that all of us here today are one of two people. We're people that have come to, to, to Sunday service to shout out for Jesus. Or we're people that have come here wearing a mask. Mm -hmm. Oh boy. Right. You came here to play church. Yeah. And here's this guy and he shouts out. He says, have mercy on me. Yeah. Many rebuked him. They told him to be quiet. And well, he shouted all the more. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. They uh, say, call the blind man, cheer up on your feet, he's calling you. This is really important to understand what it's like when you have an authentic interaction with Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. Because a lot of times, you know, especially at a church, we do and say the things that we're supposed to do and say. <clears throat> but here's a guy, he just shouted out, and people said, be quiet. He shouted out, Jesus turned and said, call him, and let me tell you how this works. Okay? There's a way things work and there's a way it works with you and Jesus, right? I got a, I got a, when you come to my house, I have a, my, my door that, that you use to get into my house. It's kind of a tricky door. It has a deadbolt lock and it has what, a handle lock. But on top of that, even when those are both unlocked, sometimes people can't get out because there's a way you have to turn my handle. Oh, wow. And so I've seen many people try to get out of my house thinking that the doors were locked because when they turn the handle the wrong way, they couldn't get out and they switch it and they try to unlock it, but they're really locking it and they try it again. And I just try every combination. And I go, okay, wait, wait, wait. This is how it works. This is sideways, this is side. And you have to turn the handle. If you turn the handle the other way, it won't open you. This is, the door's not broken and you're not insane. And it's like, oh, sorry. And people say like, I'm so dumb. I'm like, no, you're not dumb. The door's not broken. It's just how it works. Yeah, right. There's a way things work. As a parent, you try to teach your kids that. Like, hey, you can't be a jerk and have friends. That's not how life works, right? right? You can't just right. say anything you want to people and expect them to be unaffected relationally with us. That's not how it works. And so this is how it works with you and Jesus. You call him. You get his attention. And guess what he does? He calls you now. There you go. That's right. It's not just over. Hey, I need some help, Jesus. Okay, great, now he's calling you. And so my question this morning is, what's he calling you to? Whoa. For some of us, he's calling you to repent. Yeah. For some of us, he's calling you to a relationship. Mm -hmm. For some of us, he's calling you to get humble. Yes. Oh, yeah. And you're like, I'm coming to church, I'm praying to God, and nothing's happening. You don't, you don't get how it works. I, I, this is how it works. You call Jesus, he turns, and he says, okay, now you come here. Now you come here, and this is how it works, okay? You didn't just get a great relationship with God because you showed up this Sunday. That's, right. That's not how it works. On your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. I love this passage, right? Because he talks about throwing his cloak aside. What do you got to throw aside? What do you got to throw aside here? I got this uh, illustration here. Oh, wow. These are things that I think prevent us from coming to God. That's what I got. This is his laziness I got written in here, right? Oh, wow. That prevents us. Some of us just don't want to bother. We're just lazy. There's nothing there. How this one? Bitterness, right? Yeah. Come on. It's just, man. If you didn't say that thing the way you said it to me five years ago, it would all be different for me. That's right. But you said it, and you meant it, right? So there's bitterness that was in there, right? We got, uh, we got lust. That stops us, right? That's a, it's a pleasurable sin that, that hurts our conscience and destroys our self-esteem and 
Man, I don't know. When I'm struggling with this, I'd rather just not be at church. You know what I'm saying? Oh, wow. uh, let's just be honest right there. Can yep. keep it real there? Okay, great. And then uh, I've been critical. I was just being like a guy that, oh, I, oh, I hate everyone. Oh, look at that guy. Oh, he's looking so fake. You know, right? we usually just, other than thinking good things, you know, it's just like, oh, look at him. Look at that. Look at that shirt Nick's wearing. Can't stand. You know, we just say things like that, right? And these are the things. That prevent us. You know, uh, my uh, my son, uh, one of my sons, is studying the colonial the colonial period. That's the time before America was America. Uh, the way they used to uh, trap monkeys, very interesting, uh, is they used to put a fruit in a jar, and uh, and then the monkey would put his hand in the jar, and then the uh, trappers would come, and all the monkey had to do was let go, but he wouldn't. Wow. He wouldn't let go. And that's how they trap. Dang. And it's kind of like this, right? God calls us, and you've got that critical spirit that you won't let. And all you got to do to, but you, Jesus calls you, but you're, wow. you, you won't let go. And, and it's, it's funny. The secret of the whole thing, and the profound secret of it is, you are trapped. I'm stuck. But you won't let go. And that's why I love that he threw his cloak aside. Anything that got in the way between him going to Jesus, well, he threw that aside. And he. And so then you, all you, see, it's funny, I can get my hand out real easy, but when I'm trying to hold on to the lust, I can't, I, I can't, and I'm stuck, right? So my question is this, what are you holding on to that's taking a hold of you? What are you holding on to that's taking a hold of you? Where's my water go? Oh, yes, I knew that. <laughs> Satan traps us. We're not having an authentic relationship with God because we're holding on to something that was never meant to keep us. This is a powerful question. It's, a, it's an unmasking question. It's a question that I think we're afraid to answer because to answer this question, you've got to take off a mask. And it's what Jesus says. And Jesus being the master, master, he can see you. He's the master counselor. He's the master insight on you. He knows you. He's the master psychiatrist. I call whatever you want to call him. He's the king. And he says, what do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked the question. Wow. What do you want? Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, there's the answer that you give that you think is the right answer. You know, I want to be with Jesus. There's the honest answer. <laughs> there's the honest answer, right? Uh, for some of us, money. For some of it's security, for some of it's it's a boyfriend or a girlfriend. Uh, and Jesus wants a child that says, what, what, what is it that you want? And he asks us and penetrates to our very heart. What is it exactly that you want Jesus to do for you? Because here's the problem. Here's the thing. Because when, if, we, if we start to explore your honest answer, your unmasked answer, we start to explore the answer of, Oh, I, I want to retire. I want to make, you know, whatever, 4000 a month and not have to work. That's what I want. Jesus really questions that. He's like, okay, but, but why do you want that? I want, I want a boyfriend. I want a girlfriend. Okay, but why? Yeah. Because you think it will give you what? Because you think you will validate what? And here's why. And this is the frustrating thing with that, that, that God really challenges us to get through. Because here's the reality with things and with stuff, right? When you get your way, you often lose your way, wow. Wow, yeah. right? When you get your way, when you, have you seen the way people act when they think they get what they think that they wanted? Right. They think they want money, they get it, and all of a sudden that friend you knew becomes an idiot, right? They think they want a boyfriend, they think they want a girlfriend, and all everyone's like, okay, I, I'm married now, Woo, I'm out of here, friends, and that, the person they were is completely destroyed because they don't understand that they need community in order to have a successful marriage and so when you got your way you lost your way yeah right you got your way i wanted a title i wanted to be recognized and you got it and you started acting insufferable because when you got your way you find you often lose your way yeah. and god says take my way right. right and so he asks you and he challenges you jesus challenges you with this question to be deep. Yeah. And for some of us, we can do that, but for some of us, that's hard. We like to keep it in the shallow. Yeah. 
Because he says, what is it you really want? Because when you get your way, you often lose your way, right? Oh, yeah. And he, he says something very important, right? He says, blind men said, Rabbi, I want to see. And here's a prayer and here's a, a thing to ask of Jesus that I think challenges us all, right? Because what he's saying is, Jesus, I want you to take the mask off that blinds me. I want you to take off the insecurity that I've been so blinded by and terrorized by. I want you to take away the greed and idolatry in my heart that's just blinding me. Everyone else sees it, let's be honest. Sure. Just like you all see me when I'm wearing that, you know? It's like I'm not hiding from anyone. I'm just hiding from myself, really, is what I'm doing. Yeah. And he's the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see, and I love this, right? It says, God, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received this sight and followed Jesus along the road. Faith. Synonymous with courage, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Your faith, your courage. Your courage, and this is what it takes, right? It takes incredible courage on your part to get real. To get real with God. To stop wearing the mask, to stop hiding behind the masquerade, to stop pretending you don't hear or pretending it's not important to you. Right? He's saying, your faith, your courage will heal you. You know, heaven is for those with the moral courage to pursue their relationship with God, to take that step forward. Listen, I can convince you of anything today is that you're going to be able to fool me. <laughs> you are. You're going to fool me. You're going to tell me that you can't do this because, man, it's just so overwhelming. I'm going to, oh my gosh, that's overwhelming. I'm sorry. You're going to tell me you're just not feeling well enough. What am I going to do? I, can't, I, I don't have microscopic eyes. I don't know if there's a virus. I'm going to be like, oh my goodness, that's terrible. You're going to tell me you just can't do it. And I am going to believe you because I, no, I don't have that superpower. But here's the thing. God sees. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. That's what I want to convince you, that God sees who you are. And he has a question for you, right? He, he wants you to unmask. He wants you to let go. I want you to stop holding on to bitterness. How, how long are you really going to not go to Jesus because of just, just kind of let go? Or, or, I mean, we, we're a society that likes to think of ourselves as deep thinkers, and yet we find ourselves convicted by a monkey. You know what I mean? Oh, wow. We find ourselves at the same sort of problem-solving issue as the monkey. Like, oh, I'm really smart. No, I'm about as dumb as a monkey right now. To let go of it and to take a step of courage if you're out. Take this step of courage. It sounds radical. It's really not just... Study the Bible, you know? Go with the guy that brought you and say, hey, let's study. If you're studying, you're probably being challenged right now to take steps of courage. You're gonna find a group of people here that are gonna help you do that. If you're a disciple, God's calling you. Oh yeah. If you came here today saying, I need God, God says, hey, I'm here for you, come here, I'm calling you. Come on, come here, let go, I'm calling you. He's calling us to repent. He's calling us to put him first. He's calling us to be disciples. Are you with me? We with you. Let's pray. Yes, sir. God in heaven, thank you for, uh, for that of all the people in the world, you see yeah. us as we are. And what, what's great about that, God, is you see us as we are and you love us. You see our selfishness. You, you see when we lie and when we lied. You see incredible pride and arrogance or insecurity. You see, you see times when we ignore you and we don't even care about you. But God, you still love us. I pray that that when we unmask ourselves before you, that we can have the courage to step forward. Give us the courage to let go of what, anything that's taken a hold of us. And so that when Jesus asks, what do you want? That we can say, Father, take away the mask. That we want to see. We want a relationship with you. We don't want things. We want you. Because we know that through you, we have all things. We lift our hearts to you. Pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Church, we're all dismissed. Parents, please pick up your children.